Hello. Welcome to the MU Extension Garden Hour. We are so glad that you are here with us today. We've got a lot of topics to talk about today, and we hope that you learn something. Um, before we get started, I want to uh, just go over a few things here. Um, we do have MU Horticultural Specialists uh, scattered all around the state. So I would like for you to maybe find your county and look at the color and maybe identify who your horticulture specialist is. Uh, they will be well more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, you can see that I'm up here in the extreme northwest corner of Missouri um, in Nottaway County. And then you can see everybody else is kind of scattered all around the, the state. And OK, with that, I would like to turn it over to Jennifer, who is going to be our moderator today. Jennifer? Thank you, Gwen. Hi, I'm Jennifer Shooter, and I'm located in the Adair County Extension Center, Kirksville, and I will be your moderator today. And we're going to start off with a weather report from our new climatologist, Zach. So, Zach, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, a bit of a mixed report uh, this week in that we have some uh, good news and, and bad news with our weekly weather summary. The good news is that we received some rainfall that was much needed over the weekend, especially if you were north of I-70 in Missouri. It was a little more that was forecasted, and that cold front that brought the rain also helped to end our heat wave from last week. Uh, the bad news is that now we're in a bit of a quieter pattern, and it looks like another stretch of dry weather is ahead. Uh, so what I'm showing right here is on the left a map of uh, precipitation from the past seven days. Uh, you can see in the northern portion of the state, uh, one to two inches of rainfall was pretty widespread. Uh, there were some pockets in the northeast up to four inches, uh, which was very beneficial rain. Uh, to the south of I-70, it was a little bit more scattered. Uh, there were some locations that, that missed out on the rainfall completely. Um, some of the light blues here where you might see just a, a few hundredths of an inch uh, indicate some of those areas that might have missed out. Uh, but temperatures this week are a lot better than when we talked uh, last Wednesday. This map here on the right shows our high temperatures from yesterday across the Midwest. In Missouri, we saw uh, temperatures top out in the low to mid 80s. This is a huge improvement from last week. Uh, here's the same map from last Wednesday when we were dealing uh, with the mid to upper 90s. So I think everybody is excited for, for a relief from that heat wave. Um, really quickly, just wanted to show a summary. Here are some of the major Missouri weather records that were broken last week. Uh, so here in Columbia, again, we did break our all-time heat index high temperature of 118 degrees. Uh, we also set on Thursday night a daily warm minimum temperature. Uh, so, so this shows that the low only got to 78 degrees, which was the highest low temperature on that date. So this is August 24th on Thursday. And looking at some other locations outside of Columbia, this was pretty common. We had really, really high nighttime temperatures. And, and in some locations, such as St. Louis, the lows uh, didn't even get below 80 degrees. So saw a lot of those records, um, but we also tied or set a few daily high temperature records uh, in places like St. Louis, Joplin, uh, West Plain, where those temperatures got above 100 degrees. Uh, so a really unprecedented and, and record-breaking in some locations heat wave, um, but fortunately that's in the rear view mirror for now. Um, and so now that we're coming up to the end of August, I wanted to show uh, these maps that kind of show temperature-wise how we're going to settle uh, August in the record book. And actually our August temperatures are going to end up right around normal. So this map on the left for the Midwest uh, shows the departure from uh, the average conditions from August 1st to the 28th. We're in this gray area for most of the state showing that temperatures were actually near normal. Um, minimum temperatures were a little bit above normal in the state. It's really because we had a lot of rainfall and cloud cover uh, early in the month, which kind of helped to insulate temperatures at night. Um, but this may be kind of counterintuitive that we're having actually a, a pretty normal August considering the heat wave. Um, but the, the heat wave might be in our, our recent memory, but we actually had a pretty cool start to the month. Um, so this is a weather record from Columbia. We can see each day the maximum and minimum temperature. And what the column I've highlighted here is our departure from normal. 
And so you can see the first 20 or so days of the month, we really accumulated a lot of below normal temperatures. So even when we had our heat wave at the end of August, uh, when we average all this together, we're on pace to be 0 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. So uh, about as close to normal as you can get for August. So I, I thought that was an interesting tidbit where the monthly average may not tell uh, the whole story there. Um, precipitation, uh, we did see most of the states. So here we can see Missouri. Um, these are precipitation departures over the past 30 days. So blues and greens, we were above normal. That was most of the state. A uh, few locations where we see the yellow for August, um, a little bit below normal, but, but as you can see here by the legend, that's really just an inch below normal, meaning most locations still received at least three inches of rainfall, uh, which was beneficial. I do wanna show the most recent US drought monitor map on the right. Even though we've had some recent short-term precipitation, especially in August, um, there's really some long-term deficits going back to April of this year um, that we still have a ways to go uh, to, to pull out of and, and accumulate some more rainfall. So you will notice still a lot of drought in Missouri. Um, there are some locations that are still pretty far behind on rainfall. Uh, so how does this upcoming week look? Uh, again, I'll mention that it looks pretty dry. Uh, and so on the left, I'm, I'm showing from last week a similar map showing our 250 millibar wind speeds. So in this, we're kind of showing upper level atmosphere flow about 10 kilometers up into the atmosphere. And right over Missouri, we see kind of a notch in that upper level flow. What that's picking up is a, a cold front. So here on the right is our surface map. We actually have a cold front today that's draping south across the state. It's not a very strong cold front. It's not going to kick up any precipitation, but it's going to bring kind of a reinforcing shot of cooler temperatures through the end of the week. And I think uh, really some fall-like conditions, especially in the mornings over the next couple of days. Uh, I think what's gonna contribute to helping us feel more fall-like weather is this map on the left shows our, our dew point temperatures, which is good indication of surface moisture. Uh, 49 degrees in Northwestern Missouri, uh, up to the low 60s in Southeastern Missouri, this is much, much better than where we were last week when we had dew points in the upper 70s to low 80s. That was really an uncomfortable, muggy air mass. Uh, it's gonna feel pretty cool and crisp for the next three or four days with these much lower dew points. Um, I wanna show uh, on the right, kind of looking at, at wind speeds across uh, the United States because we, we have a couple of tropical disturbances, including uh, Hurricane Idalia, which made landfall uh, in Florida this morning. Um, but these are actually helping with that cold front, kind of locking us out of that Gulf moisture. You can see where the winds are, are spiraling counterclockwise. They're really uh, reinforcing that, that northerly winds across uh, Missouri and not allowing some of those higher dew points to reach up into the area. So it's going to keep us uh, pretty cool over the next few days. Now, moving forward, I think going into the weekend and next week, we're going to have a slow uh, warm up. And so this is a forecast graphic from the National Weather Service in St. Louis. I think it does a good job covering the forecast really for the whole state. Um, through the end of the week, high temperatures in the upper 70s and lower 80s. But by the time we get to, to Labor Day, I think we'll see 90 degrees return, some humidity as well. I also wanna point out that, that low temperatures Thursday and Friday morning will be in the, the lower to, to middle 50s across a lot of the state. So it's gonna feel pretty cool I wouldn't be surprised if a few uh, really outlying locations could, could dip below 50 um, over the next couple of mornings. But we're also going to stay very dry as we continue this warm up. And this is because we're expecting yet another uh, large upper level ridge to build in over, over the central United States again. Uh, so here we see by Sunday, the jet streams well to our north, which just like last week uh, means high pressure underneath that warm uh, air and, and drier conditions as well. So um, we're going to see that that ridge build in here, which means not a lot of precip uh, to come again. And so this is uh, the forecasted precipitation amounts for the next seven days from the Weather Prediction Center. You'll see a smattering of light green across Missouri. Um, that's supposed to be next Tuesday. We'll see if there can be a disturbance that gives us rainfall. Um, but I think any locations across the state that do see rain over the next seven days will be very lucky and it'll be light precipitation. Uh, very dry, 
otherwise. And um, to kind of end today, I, I want to mention that it really looks like this pattern could kind of stick around for the start of September. Uh, so these graphics are from the Climate Prediction Center. They do some of the longer range outlooks for the United States. Uh, and what they're indicating is for the first two uh, weeks of September, a really high likelihood of above normal temperatures across much of the central United States. So almost 100% chance going into next week. Uh, so, so almost certain to have those higher than normal temperatures. Uh, precipitation next week is forecasted to be near normal. There's a couple disturbances uh, later in the week next week that, that hopefully can pan out and, and give us a little bit of rainfall. Um, but then even going into the second week of September, that heat is expected to stick around uh, with some, some leaning towards drier conditions as well. Um, so not good news for drought. We, we really need uh, a lot more rain as we go into the fall, um, but it doesn't look like we're gonna get a lot in the way of relief over the next couple of weeks. Um, finally, with some of this heat, uh, the Climate Prediction Center, this is a, one of their excessive heat hazards maps. They have highlighted all of Missouri in a moderate risk for excessive heat, uh, from September 6th to September 12th. And so this is showing uh, a risk for heat. We're looking at temperatures above the 90th percentile. Uh, so pretty unusually warm in Missouri. That means we're, we're looking at the 90s returning again in the first couple of weeks of September. Uh, so we can't quite shake the heat. Uh, I'd recommend enjoying the next few days where it really feels like fall because I think it's more of a summer-like pattern um, coming up. So that's all I've got today, uh, and I'll leave my contact information as well. So thanks for having me. All right, thank you, Zach. And now we'll get into our other gardening topics, and Manoj is going to talk to us about fall lawn herbicides. Sure, thanks, Jennifer. Let me pull up my screen here. Okay, I hope everything is good on your end. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the herbicide options for residential lawn. As you can see in the picture, there's an overwhelming, tremendous amount of herbicide products in the market. And for the homeowners, especially the beginners one, it's really daunting tax to find out and select the product that you need. You know, there's all kinds for grassy weeds, broad leaves, um, uh, and then there's a market for uh, organic products as well in the market right now. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we have in the market and how to best select the herbicides. Before we jump into that, I want to give you a brief background on the weeds in general. For those of you who do not know much about weeds, generally for the lawns, uh, we can classify weeds into two types, grassy weeds and broadleaf weeds. Grassy weeds looks like a grass. They don't have a uh, bright flowers, they are grass. And for example, some of the species uh, you might be familiar with are crabgrass, foxtail, goose grass, and those type of things. And for those grassy weeds, for all those grassy weeds and lawns, we manage them primarily by spraying pre emergent herbicides. And the pre emergent herbicides are simply the herbicides that are applied before the weeds emerge. And that is generally done in the springtime before they emerge. Or for some of the winter animals, we can do that in fall time, but fall pre emergent is not very common uh, as much as the spring pre emergent, for example, your crabgrass brew renter. Okay, so today I'm going to talk more on these broadleaf weeds control rather than grassy weeds. So, broadleaf weeds control. Um, from the broadleaf, common broadleaf weeds are dandelions, clovers, and things like that. It has bright flowers on your lawns. Um, so they can be primarily managed by spraying on them. And those herbicides are called post-emergent because we apply those herbicides when the weeds are active and young. Okay? And I have bold faced that word active and young because these herbicides will work best when your weeds are actively growing and they are young. If it is already mature and is flowering like in the picture here, then your herbicides will not be as effective as it was applied when it was young and tiny. And also, 
uh, actively growing, meaning when the, there's not enough moisture or like the drought we had, uh, we had in the past in July, uh, if it is too hot, too dry, that, that weed is not actively growing. So your herbicides that you applied on that weed will not be taken up by the weeds uh, as effectively as it should and therefore will not be effective, okay? So you have to, so the herbicides will work best when your weeds are actively growing with the optimum growing conditions. Now, one of the options that we have in terms of herbicides, uh, the one most common one in the old herbicides we know is 2,4-D. And this 2,4-D is very good at killing the weeds that has a taproot system. For example, dandelions, plantains, um, safer spurs, and those type of weeds. And, and just keep in mind that this 2,4-D will not kill some of these weeds that are very common in your lawns, like for example, clover, chickweed, ground ivy. They do not do, they do not, you know, do anything when you spray on them. Uh, you have another herbicides which are called MCPA slash MCPP. Uh, they are very effective in controlling chickweeds and clover. Another one is dicamba. It's very effective with the weeds that are more with a frosted growth habit, like frosted knotweed, frosted spurs, or common purslane. And these are a very common weeds on your lawns. Another with a different chemistry is a triclopyr. And uh, triclopyr, uh, it works on a number of weeds. I've, I have listed here, for example, ground ivy, uh, wild violet, bull thistle, but it will not work as effective. Um, uh, like a 2,4-D for dandelions, okay? So you can see there are a lot of different products and chemistry in the market, and it depends on what kind of weeds you have. You, of course, have to know what weeds we are dealing with in the first place, and also what product you are buying, because when you go out in the market and want to buy the herbicides, it can be very daunting to find out what the active ingredient is in that product in itself, right? Uh, for example, it's a very common to find a product that says uh, three-way herbicides. And it's generally three different herbicides mixed in together. That's 2,4-D, MCPP, and dicamba. It's sold and marketed as a three-way herbicides when all these three are formulated in one single jug. And that's actually the biggest bang out of the buck for homeowners, in my opinion, because you are getting three different chemistries and you are getting a lot of weed control out of that product. But one recommendation I would say for a homeowner is to stay away from a product that's touted as you know, weed and feed or two-in-one, sometimes three-in-one product. So what that is basically is it's a fertilizer but also has some herbicides mixed in, in that product. So you get ready to go just one job or one pass, you can provide fertilizers and weed control. But the timing of that product for the herbicides and fertilizer is not sound from the perspective of agronomy because the timing for fertilizer is not, does not coincide with uh, weed control. So you are not bringing just the products at the wrong time and therefore not very effective in weed control. Or if you focus on weed control, then your fertilizer is gonna be off the balance. So I would suggest homeowners to stay up from these kind of products. Uh, but if you wanna get a good weed control and wanna know the what you are buying and what you wanna control by just looking at the different you know, efficacy and their range of uh, target pests, then you can get too much, uh, good success with controlling weeds. Another one, uh, sausages or nutsays, what we call purple nutsays or yellow nutsays. For those, these, these are not grasses, these are not broadleaves, these are different kinds of uh, weeds and they are most effectively controlled by a product that has um, chemistry uh, like halosulfurone or sulfentrazone. Yeah. And before I finish that, I just want to uh, point out some of the precautions that you need to take when you are applying herbicides. You have to mix that in adequate water. If you are buying concentrated, mix that in proper water. Too much or too little, both are not helpful. They won't do good. Uh, just you know the right amount of water, mix that properly in your tank. Know how to operate your sprayer. Do not spray in high pressure. It will just do the fine droplets and misting, which will be more risk for risk for uh, drift and things like that. Always watch the weather, uh, follow the label and see what's the best ideal time to apply that herbicide. 
And uh, when a day has uh, more than three miles screen speed and temperatures above 85, generally the herbicides are not recommended to apply. Also, the, some of the products containing dicamba and triclopyr, they are very mobile within the soil types. And if you spray those products near your ornamentals and trees and tree plants, then they tend to move with your ornamentals and they can kill those plants, including vegetable uh, garden as well. So know your products, uh, read the labels and follow the labels and you can get uh, successful with the weed control. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you, back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Manoj. Our next question is what are spots? And Jennifer, what? I'm sorry to interrupt you. There was a question in the chat box. Okay. What do you recommend to control Bermuda grass in flower beds? Well, that's a very common question. And Bermuda grass in itself is very, very uh, obnoxious weeds. It's very hardy. Uh, uh, I think for the homeowners, your chemical options is very limited. Uh, you have a product called Tenacity. It's an uh, active ingredient is mesotrion. You can use that. It, of course, needs repeated application. But for the homeowners, uh, it's very expensive product for sure. Uh, but the homeowners, the ideal way is the cultural management, you know, just stopping that Bermuda grass stolons and rhizomes to, from encroaching to your flower beds. The, the cultural or, I mean, physical method where you can block that space, you know, uh, whether it's be digging a small trains, using landscaping fabric, uh, pavement stones and things like that. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you, Manoj. The qu next question is, what are the spots and white bugs on the leaves of my dogwood tree? And Druba is going to answer this question. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Yes, uh, we, uh, we received few pictures of the dogwood tree for diagnosis, uh, which had some issues. So these are the two pictures uh, we received. And in these two pictures, we saw two different issues. So the number one issue was the dogwood uh, anthracnose. And the second one, uh, white caterpillar, uh, we can see on the second picture was uh, dogwood sawfly caterpillar. So uh, I will talk about them briefly and their control measures So uh, in this talk. So let's talk uh, about the dogwood uh, uh, anthracnose first. Uh, this is a fungal disease and it is caused by a fungus uh, uh, whose scientific name is Discula destructiva. So as uh, this name contains destructiva, it is highly destructive fungus in dogwood. Uh, so uh, it can cause the problem in um, almost all varieties of uh, native uh, flowering dogwood and Pacific dogwood. They, uh, uh, they are susceptible to this disease. Let's talk about the symptoms. So the main symptoms, uh, uh, so how can we uh, diagnose whether that is uh, anthracnose or uh, any other disease in dogwood. So as we see uh, in the top left picture here uh, with more leaves, uh, at, the, at the beginning uh, we see uh, uh, small tan spurs with reddish purple margins on the leaves. And these spurs uh, will develop into a large and irregularly shaped uh, brown blotches uh, in the uh, in the later stage, and these uh, infected leaves may become distorted, cupped, and curled. And uh, those infected leaves may drop uh, early in the fall, and sometimes the tree may be like partially or totally leafless uh, before uh, uh, before the fall season begins. Uh, this disease also uh, affect on the twigs, uh, uh, young twigs, and those affected twigs may have some sunken tan to brown spots uh, with purple borders. 
and these spurs may enlarge and they girdle the twig and that results for twig uh, die back. Uh, we can see some of those, some of those blotches and those uh, uh, enlarged uh, uh, spurs here in those pictures. All right, so before I talk about the management of this disease, uh, let me talk briefly about what are the favorable factors to develop those fungal disease in our plant. So uh, I want to talk about the disease triangle. Uh, as we can see, the disease triangle in the right-hand side here in this slide, and we see that uh, uh, inside the triangle, we see uh, the word disease and we see uh, pathogen, host, and environment in those three corners. So, so this triangle uh, 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 describe that to develop any disease in any plants, uh, these three factors should be met, should be fulfilled. And these three factors, they are uh, pathogen, uh, which is a fungus uh, here uh, in this case, the second factor is host. And uh, uh, in this case, the dogwood tree is the host here. And the third factor is the environment. So environment means, so um, uh, it is the temperature, uh, humidity in the air, and moisture and shading. So uh, almost all fungus, they require uh, abundant moisture uh, in the uh, in the plant surface and in the soil, uh, and they require uh, the optimum level of relative humidity in the air, and said so. Uh, this uh, this causes to develop the disease in uh, any plant. So, uh, in case of this dogwood, uh, especially on the lower canopy uh, or the lower canopy branches, uh, which are which are crowded they are most susceptible to infect some from this disease um, at, the, at the beginning. So uh, if we have any fungus and uh, if that tree branches are crowded, then they might develop. And uh, if, uh, uh, if there is some moisture. Uh, and when the fungus is uh, uh, established on those, uh, on those lower branches, then it uh, spreads uh, upward within the canopy. Okay, so now let's talk about how can how can we control, how can we minimize, or how can we manage this uh, disease in dogwood? So uh, we should plant um, the disease-free saplings. Uh, uh, if we are planting any dogwood tree, uh, we should uh, we should avoid uh, using the transplants uh, like the transplanting tree from the forest. So they might uh, have already disease on them. Uh, uh, we, should, we should remove and destroy uh, if we see any uh, uh, infected plant parts like leaf and twigs, uh, and destroy them in a safe place. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to avoid uh, overhead watering to reduce uh, humidity around the tree. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, we need to we need to thin those uh, those crowded branches so that we can improve uh, the air circulation uh, in the in the tree. Uh, we can also apply some fungicides that contain chlorothalonil or mancochev uh, as uh, as a preventive measure uh, during during the growing season. And there are there are some resistant varieties of dogwood uh, uh, I found in uh, some. Uh, some articles, and they are like Kausa dogwood or Tartarian dogwood or Red Osea dogwood. So we can we can consider uh, supplanting them if uh, uh, if we have this type of problems in our area. So the second issue in this tree was uh, the dogwood sawfly caterpillar. Uh, as uh, we can see uh, in the top left. Uh, Picture here in this slide, those uh, dogwood adult sawfly, they are slender, uh, shiny black color, and wasp-like insects. And these uh, and this insect, this adult insect uh, lay up to like about 100 eggs 
in a leaf uh, using a saw-like uh, uh, ob uh, ovipositor on the leaf. Then these eggs uh, causes a small bump on the on the leaf, and that uh, eventually turns brown color. Those uh, um, egg turns to brown color, and from these eggs, uh, caterpillars are emerged uh, in the leaf. And these caterpillars, so they they feed on our uh, um, um, uh, dogwood leaf, but they change their color depends on uh, on their stage. So there are many larval stages uh, of those dogwood sawfly, and they change their texture. They change uh, their uh, uh, color and appearance like many times during their development. So uh, especially for the feeding leaf, the second larval stays. So uh, it is covered in a uh, white uh, waxy covering. And the last larval instar, uh, we can see here uh, in those uh, uh, top right hand side uh, uh, of the picture. So uh, that larval ester uh, is uh, uh, yellow and black color. So, and these larvae are about an inch long and uh, especially young caterpillar. So they feed on our leaf uh, heavily and they feed uh, in the group. And, uh, uh, and the older caterpillars, they eat uh, everything, everything uh, except the mid rib. And they feed in a group. And those mature caterpillars sometimes they also they also bore into the decaying soft wood uh, of the of the tree, and sometimes they bore on the uh, on the landscape timber, and sometimes sometimes in the lawn furniture as well. Okay, so the next thing is how can we control? How can we manage uh, the damage from those dogwood soft like caterpillar? So. Small caterpillars can be uh, can be dislodged by shaking the trees, um, and uh, we can we can kill them like uh, by our feet, uh, trample trample them by uh, uh, by something. If there is uh, excessive defoliation, uh, we can uh, also spray some type of uh, insecticidal soap or uh, like some of the botanical botanical herbicide, uh, like some oils. And they are they are effective as long as the caterpillars are like uh, less than an uh, inch long. However, those um, like those mature caterpillar or uh, later stage caterpillar, uh, they are very tough to kill uh, by uh, by uh, those soaps and those oils. And uh, we can also spray uh, uh, some insecticide. They are level for the residual landscape uh, and. So uh, they also they also provide some um, uh, some level of management. However, so uh, those uh, those larvae and, uh, uh, insects are developed from the egg, and uh, we might need to spray like those multiple times uh, in those tree. Uh, Jennifer, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Druba. Our next question is: What are all these spots on my apples? And Gwen is going to answer this question. Hello, thank you. Sorry, it took me a little bit of time to get my screen up there. So the cooler temperatures may have prompted you to go out and take a look at your apple tree or some of the fruit trees that you might have in your yard. And you may be looking at them and thinking, oh my gosh, there's smudges and things on my apples. Well, what can be causing that? So I wanted to address that topic a little bit today. So, Take a look at this apple that you see here. This was on my desk when I came into work on Monday. And just in the chat, just kind of write down or type something up there that you see happening with that apple. And I can't see the chat. So Jennifer, maybe if you could read something off if they come up. Nothing yet. <laughs> Nothing yet. Okay, well, we'll keep going then. Wilting, worms. Okay, maybe you worm or insect holes, insects, maybe drought. Okay, good. Well, I think you're on the right track. The thing that the homeowner was curious about were these black spots that you see here and these smudges. 
that you also see. So they saw smudges, they saw splot, spots, and then they also saw these pits like from that could be caused from an insect. And so you can see with this apple, there are actually more than, than one thing that's kind of working on this, this fruit. So what is it? So if we take a look at that apple, the smudges are something that's called sm smooty, sooty blotch, sorry about that. And I think that this one, as well as the other thing that's causing the little black pinpricks is called fly speck. Both of those are very common and are often called just the autumn diseases. Uh, they're just very, very common in our, in our fruits. Both of these are types of surface fungi that do not cause any kind of rot or anything with the apple. You can scrub them off to make them look a little bit better and they're perfectly fine to eat. It just, it's just a cosmetic issue with that. Now, the third thing that you see there, uh, and, and also the, the fungi, since it is a fungus, it can't, fungi, it can be, controlled just by maintaining good air circulation. So pruning your tree properly and letting the canopy be open enough that air can flow through, that's going to be a good way to manage that without using any sprays or herbicides. Then the third thing, and the fruit is perfectly edible as well. So the pits that you see on the fruit, those are probably caused by a critter of some sort, coddling moth perhaps, or plum, Curcuyo, I'm not sure I'm saying that one correctly, um, but those are two very common insects that might be, or bugs that might be attacking the fruit. In all of these cases, if you see the, the, the fungus or you see the pits, it's really too late at this point to do any kind of herbicide or pesticide treatment. All of that would need to be done earlier in the spring, uh, right after the blossoms fall off of the flower and the fruit, the ovary that's left there. But the main thing, oops, sorry, the main thing is that the fruit is perfectly edible. You can still um, peel the fungus off of the apple or peel the peeling. You can use that apple to make apple butter or press it to make some apple cider. It will still taste really, really good. And that is all that I have. All right, thank you, Gwen. You can kind of see we have a theme going here on spots. <laughs> and our next question is, what are those black spots on the leaves of my maple trees? And I am going to answer that question. And I will give you guys a, a few seconds to put in the chat what you think these spots are. and. Would someone please tell me if you see any answers? Yeah, sure. Leaf gall. Anything else? Galls. <laughs> All right. So what are these spots on my maple tree? Tar splashing. It is tar spot. And tar spot is a fungal disease that primarily occurs on silver maple trees. It is likely to occur during, during a rainy period. And like you see in the photos, it is characterized by black raised spots on the leaves. The fungus that causes this issue survives the winter on fallen leaves. And in the spring, mature spores of the fungus are released and blown by the wind to newly emerging leaves. Tar spot does not cause harm to big, mature, established trees. And you wanna make sure that you rake and remove infected leaves. So if you have a silver maple tree that has this issue, you wanna make sure that you get all those leaves raked up in the fall and burned or bagged and taken away from the tree because the inoculum will be there for next spring and you'll have this problem again. But I will say that most years when it is rainy, we see this problem and it is no concern. So don't get worried if you see this on your silver maple tree. 
In this photo on the left, you see the tree that the leaf came from. This tree is near the Adair County Extension Center. It's a very large old tree. And you can see that that tree is not going to die or be harmed by tar spot. It's an old tree, so it's probably going to die from old age before it dies from tar spot. And if anyone has any more or has any questions, just put them in the chat and we'll move on to our next question. And our next topic is on anthracnose on tomatoes. And Druva is going to address this question. Oh, give me, give me a second. Give me a second, Jennifer. I'm having a hard time pursuing my screen. Give me a second, okay? Okay. Uh, I think I can do it now. All right. All right. So can you see my screen now, Jennifer? Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. So today I'm talking on the second anthracnose. So it looks like the anthracnose uh, uh, day for me. So this one is in tomato, tomato fruit, tomato crop. Okay, so this is so uh, this disease in tomato is also caused by a fungus, and the name of the fungus, uh, the scientific name of the fungus is Calytrotrichum, uh, as a as a genus, and uh, it has like multiple species. Uh, they cause this problem, and among those uh, among those different species, uh, the Calytrotrichum uh, cocos is. Uh, uh, is causing the severe problem, uh, uh, especially in the fruits, and uh, that um, that includes the tomato. So uh, it is uh, mainly a disease of ripe and overripe tomato fruits. And if uh, we do not control this disease on time, it results in serious loss, uh, especially in the fruit quality uh, and the yield as well. So. Uh, for this disease, uh, moist and uh, humid uh, conditions favor the disease development uh, in the field, in the high tunnel, and uh, in the in the greenhouse. So uh, this fungus also causes uh, tomato root infection as well, and which uh, we call as a black dot root rot, and uh, which causes serious loss. Uh, especially in the greenhouse and high tunnel tomato production. Okay, so now let's talk about the symptoms of this disease, uh, uh, especially in the fruits first. So uh, those fungus, they uh, they can uh, they can infect to the uh, mature green tomato fruit. However, those symptoms they do not appear until the fruit begin to ripe. So uh, they might live there like uh, in the uh, in the dormant stage or latent stage, and they do not show any symptom when the fruit is green. And on ripe fruit, the symptoms appear uh, uh, as uh, we can see here on those uh, those top picture. Uh, you can see here. So there is a uh, uh, small uh, small is small. Uh, 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 Small spot and that is slightly depressed, and uh, we can see there is uh, circular lesions, and uh, the lesion will uh, enlarge into the beak. So uh, it uh, it grow up to about twelve millimeter in diameter, then uh, it uh, it becomes sunken. Uh, we can see here uh, in this uh, this top picture here, and they. Uh, and that ring develop uh, to a concentric ring. And the center of the lesion is uh, usually tan color. Uh, so we can see here in this picture. And as the lesion matures, it becomes uh, dotted with a small black specks. And that is formed by the fungus, by the pathogen. And this black speck is uh, called as microsclerosia. So that is the fungal uh, fungal fruiting body. So 
uh, during the moist weather, uh, we can also see some mass of like uh, salmon, salmon color uh, uh, spores, and they may be present on the uh, on the lesion surface. So we can see here, uh, especially uh, especially on this uh, on this fruit here, on those left hand side of of this picture here. And uh, individual uh, lesions, uh, they enlarge and form like large blemishes and uh, they, uh, they cover the large part of the fruit surface. And uh, if we have this problem on those fruits, uh, those, uh, those infected fruits have very short storage life uh, and these fruits may be uh, invaded by secondary, secondary infection, for example, like uh, yeast and soft soft uh, rotting bacteria. So uh, these are the symptoms on the fruit. So let me, let me also talk uh, some of the symptoms on uh, stem, leaves, and roots of tomato. So this fungus uh, also, also cause the damage and uh, like some symptom on the stem, leaf, and roots. Uh, infected leaves have uh, small circular brown lesions and the lesion is surrounded by a uh, uh, yellow uh, halo. So uh, in the in the roots, uh, infected roots have like uh, brown lesions, and roots begin to uh, senes, uh, begin to die. And uh, we can see uh, the black microsclerosia. They are formed on the root surface, and. Uh, the secondary roots are stunted and sometimes they are like decayed or decomposed. And uh, uh, if, we, if we pull out those disease plants, so we can, we can pull them easily from the soil because most of their root systems are uh, already damaged. So if it is, uh, if it is severely, uh, severely infected. All right, so now let's talk, how can we manage? So how can we minimize? How can we control this disease in tomato? So, uh, so this fungus causing anthragnos survive from crop to crop. You know, they can survive uh, in those crop residue uh, and uh, in, the, in the soil as well, and they survive for a long period of time. So if we have this problem in our field or in our uh, high tunnel or greenhouse, we need to we need to follow crop rotation with other non solanaceous crop, uh, and uh, we need to do that at least for a few years uh, to decrease their level of those viable viable fungus inoculum in the soil. Otherwise, uh, they will they will come back and reinfect our solanaceous crop. Uh, especially especially in the home garden, uh, if we have just like few plants of tomato, and if we see those problems. So uh, we can we can take out the fruit and uh, we can we can destroy those infected fruits. That helps to prevent the buildup of of those fungus in the soil, uh, and uh, we can we can take those uh, infected fruits and discard uh, uh, somewhere in the far distance from our uh, main tomato uh, tomato field or garden. Uh, so other other method to minimize this problem is uh, we need to uh, we need to minimize the uh, uh, overhead irrigation system as much as possible to decrease any fungal disease uh, in any crops uh, uh, and that is the case in tomato as well. So uh, we should try to minimize uh, weighting leaves of those tomato foliage uh, as much as we can. And uh, other other method is controlling weeds. So many weeds. Uh, are the alternative host of this fungus. So uh, we, need to, we need to control the weed when they are small in tomato field. And uh, staking tomato plants, so uh, that provides the cool, uh, like uh, good uh, uh, air, air circulation to our foliage, tomato foliage and mulching with strain plastic also uh, helps to reduce the loss from uh, uh, this disease. Uh, we can we can also uh, uh, spray fungicide and that help to control if we apply periodically from like first fruit set until we uh, harvest the fruit and and there are some tomato cultivars that contain like slow ripening or no ripening gene and they and they uh, they uh, appear more resistant to this disease 
And for the, uh, for the root rot problem uh, from this disease, uh, we, can, we can minimize that by uh, not taking the soil from those infected field and infected uh, those greenhouse and the high tunnel. And uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can also minimize by avoiding the closed recirculation like those fortigation system uh, that, can, that can also transfer those fungus to the healthy plant. And uh, especially in the greenhouse and high tunnel, if, uh, if it is possible, uh, we can also pasteurize soil, like to treat the soil with steam or broad spectrum fumigants. Uh, we can also uh, 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 do that method. And uh, when we work in the greenhouse and high tunnel and in the field, we should, uh, we should prevent like uh, tomato root injury while we work in the garden. So that also helps to minimize this type of problem. So that's all I have, Jennifer. Thank you, Dhruva. Our next question is, how do you control grubs in the lawn? And Manoj is going to answer this question. Sure. Okay, uh, now let's move from herbicides to grubs in the lawns. So one thing I noticed in recent years, you know, when you talked about lawn, we first talked about grass seed, fertilizers, herbicides, and grubs or insecticides has really been the fourth on the list in terms of market and demand. It's just amazing how much the demand has grown uh, in the past few years for the grubs control. Uh, and, and, and many homeowners things are starting to think these are the routine annual operation or program, which should not be. Uh, actually, this is not an annual routine program for sure. This is more like a um, once you have a problem, then you treat those. Okay? Not has to be like a weed control or a fertilizer program. But let's talk about a little bit more in the grubs. Uh, again, when we say grubs, these are like a tiny um, just caterpillars of different beetles and jaffers. Uh, for example, Japanese beetles, Southern Max jaffers. So these are some of the um, adults name and, and for the young caterpillars, we call them grubs in general. These are a white body, tan head, three pairs of legs, and you can find them in the garden, lawns, or vegetable garden, flower beds, and all, all kinds of places. But this, this is a life cycle. I just wanted to show you that uh, so that we have a rough idea of uh, how they develop and uh, over winter. Uh, this is not perfectly lined up with the Missouri uh, climate, uh, but you can get a rough idea. Uh, in Missouri, the Japanese beetles, for example, in this life cycle, they, they turn into adults sometime in June, and June and July are their uh, flight time. And right after they start, uh, um, after four or five weeks, they start laying eggs, and those eggs will hatch into uh, larva, and which we call grubs. So these larva are the damaging one when it comes to lawns. The adults in itself are not damaging to lawn. They are, of course, damaging to other crops. But for the lawns, this, these uh, grubs are the damaging one. They go and prune those roots. So these are the root feeders. They are not feeding on your um, canopy. And again, different kinds, different stages of larva, first in star, second in star, and third in star. So the third in star, the bigger one, right before uh, the spring, that's the one, the most damaging one um, in terms of the level of damage. Uh, but we see feeding from the grubs um, in springtime, in fall time, in summertime, but the most significant damage uh, is, is more uh, from the third in star larva in the springtime. Okay. And depending on where we are at in the timeline, the options of insecticides that we apply, it, it varies. The efficacy varies. The products that we choose vary because not all the products works the same. Okay. So before we dive into that insecticide options, I just want to point out that you know, grubs might invite other creatures like raccoons, skunks, moles, bows. Um, pocket golfers, those type of animals. Um, but it's not always the case. Okay, People might think that, oh, I have these um, critters on my lawns because I have grubs problems. And that's not always the case. Yes, when there are grubs problems, then that might invite, but it's not always true. Okay, Because this um, 
mammals, they are also there for uh, foraging your earthworms in the lawns. So first thing in terms of crop control is identifying if you have a crop problems or not, okay? And the way to do that is be scouting what we call, right? Go out there and look for the grubs and they're very easy to find. So the recommendation is to bring your sap or shovel or something like that, dig a, a, about a one square foot area and pull the turf. So it's very easy to pull the turf if it has been damaged by the grub in the first place. So once you pull the turf and look for the grubs, right? These active white grubs beneath that thatch layer, beneath that turf layer. So that's, that's where they live. And if you find at least five or more than five in one square foot area, and that's what we call the minimum threshold. And that's what warrants the insecticides because the healthy turf, healthy lawn can always tolerate some level of damage from the grubs and, and all, all kinds of insects, right? So understanding that the thresholds, the when you need to actually apply insecticides is very critical in terms of insect management, including grubs. So if you have at least five in that one square foot area, then only you need to apply insecticides. Otherwise, it can tolerate that damage. And if you see one, um, if you see a problem in one specific spot, then might be just that particular spot needs to be treated and not the entire lawn. So you, you can, if you find more than five in one spot, you can go and scout and survey the another spot and see how much is spreading are there throughout your yard. If you see in multiple spots, then yes, your entire yard is affected. Uh, if you see just one spot, then you might just need to treat in one spot because you don't wanna to apply too much of products uh, just for the sake of environment and also for the sake of your um, um, money. And also you wanna protect the natural living organisms in that um, turf grass system. So when it comes to uh, insecticides, we have two options here, preventive insecticides and curative insecticides, okay? So this is a little bit different than when we talk about preventive and curative here. So preventive insecticides for crop control is something you apply in summer, in June and July, right before your adult start laying eggs, okay? So what happens is if you apply these insecticides, they will stay there for a long time. They have a long residual life. They will stay there for uh, you know a four to six weeks, and then once they hatch out of that eggs, then that those insecticides will kill that early young grubs. If that makes sense, so you do not apply these preventive insecticides in fall or spring, because in the fall time or spring time, those grubs are bigger and these preventive insecticides will not work for bigger grubs. They will only work for young, uh, uh, early grubs, okay? And some of the insecticides uh, and preventive sites are midacropid and corantraniliprol. And these two are products that you wanna apply in June and July, okay? You are applying these before they turn to big, uh, mature grubs, okay? And the next one in the class is curative insecticides. And you want to apply those in fall time and also in springtime if needed. So this will kill all the stages of grubs, but also these are more effective on these uh, larger grubs, right? Second star and third star uh, grubs. And you apply that. Um, so some products are Carbaryl 7, very common one, right? And trichlorophon. So these insecticides, the curative insecticides, they will work in, in all kinds of, uh, all species of grubs and also adults for sure, but you wanna apply just for the grubs and not for the adults. Okay, and whenever you apply these insecticides, you want to follow that with at least half inch of irrigation. If you do not have irrigation, then you have to time that perfectly with your rainfall. Otherwise that product needs to go down to the deep root zone so that those insecticides will get in contact with the grubs because the grubs are not coming out um, on the surface. Some people also recommend doing at least uh, one tenth or two tenth of an inch uh, of irrigation before applying the product. And that will make the grubs come up a little bit higher on the surface. And then in the, you apply insecticides and then again follow that with the, about a half inch of irrigation. Irrigation is really critical in terms of efficacy of the insecticides for crop control, okay? Because these are root feeders, they are below in the root zone and you wanna heat those grubs with the insecticides as much as you can. 
Another point I want to make is, is that um, research has found that some of these uh, pyrethroid-based insecticides, what we call, uh, that ends up with these trine suffix in the end, bifenthrin, cyflutrin, uh, permethrin, those type of insecticides do not work on grubs, okay? Um, they, because these are root feeders and th these insecticides do not work on root feeders. They work on adults, beetles, if you want to spread them, but they won't work on grubs. So that's the point I'm making here today. That's all from me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Manoj. And now I will turn it back over to Gwen to close us out. Well, what a great uh, list of topics we've covered today. Uh, a lot of information on spots and diseases and things that we can do to control some of those things. So I want to thank you all for participating and answering our questions and being here, sharing your time with us. We really do appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of information. I guess I'm not showing my screen, am I? Sorry, there we go. Um, where we are, you can find us on YouTube at MUIPM. This is what you can search in the YouTube search and you'll find snippets of some of the different programs and talks that we've given today, plus those that are archived. We also have just a recording of the live stream that is out there that you can find. And then if you want to subscribe to get notification of when the garden hours occur with the Zoom link and join via Zoom rather than watching it on YouTube, you can do that from uh, this page that you see right down here where it says Horticulture Town Hall. So make sure that you understand that I just want to make sure you knew that those sources were out there. Uh, also, if you wanted to get the next stream, I just wanted to bring up uh, our future times. Again, it's always going to be noon to one. And then here's today, August 30th, and then the dates in September. And if you would like a question to be addressed on the garden hour, you would go to this website right here, ipm.missouri.edu uh, to you in halls and you can subscribe and submit questions right there at that site. And then lastly, um, you can also save the chat. We put lots of uh, resources, web pages and things like that in the chat. You just go to the three little dots right here and click on that and you can see the record or the to save button so that you can save the chat. And lastly, I'll put the screen up here that shows all of our different horticulture specialists around the state. We are all happy and eager to help you with any questions that you might have with your garden plants or trees. Just make sure you reach out to us and we'll go from there. Thank you all very much for coming today.